kings of Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation, I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading this morning Our epistle reading is from the letter to the Hebrews. This is from chapter 11, beginning with verses 1 through 3. Then we skip down to verses 8 through 16. And this is on page 225 of your pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, then 8 through 16. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, even when called to go up to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such, th- such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson this morning is from Luke 12, verses 32 through 40, and this is in your pew Bible, beginning on page 75 of the New Testament. Luke 12, 32 through 40. Listen now. Listen as we hear the word of the Lord brought to us. Do not be afraid, little flock. 
For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night, or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You must also be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pause with me for just a moment and pray. O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and of all our hearts be always acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As summer vacation begins, in, or it ends, and in just a few weeks, school's going to be starting back. Perhaps this morning some of us are feeling a little yearning in our hearts, a little this yearning this morning for one more adventure, one more trip before the season ends. So let's talk about some people this morning who are on a journey, on the adventure of a lifetime. Now there's a couple of them that come to mind. Right now I'm thinking of my, some of my members of, uh, some members of my family who got a bit of wanderlust lust earlier this year and they answered that old siren call to see America first. So earlier this summer, they left behind hearth and home, and right now, they're out on our country's highways. They opted to avoid interstates and instead took back roads and scenic routes, roads little known and little traveled. They have driven all across the country, from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast, on just one old road that they had never been before. And now they're heading back by way of another route altogether. And this is part of their great quest to discover America. They are looking for something different. They are looking for something that's also maybe a little bit better, better than what we know, better than what they know. They're looking for the best of what we are, and they're finding what is along the way. Now just imagine, imagine the preparations they had to make for such a long journey, more than just in the Boy Scout bag here. Imagine the amount of planning and packing they had to do. How could you ever decide what to take? How could you decide what you would wear, not knowing exactly what you would encounter, whether the weather would be hot or cold or rainy or fair? How could you prepare your car for a terrain that might be hilly or flat, rocky or smooth? Possibly you would encounter all of these, those things being on such a long trip on an unknown, little-traveled road, road that you weren't familiar with. I imagine Matt Cusper also hiking the Appalachian Trail. He might have had a similar dilemma. How do you get ready for such a journey? How do you get ready for such a journey? Well, our scripture lessons this morning speak of a similar quest, a search for a better country, as the writer of the letter to the Hebrews terms it. Now, the letter writer reminds his readers, who were the descendants of Abraham, he reminds them of where they came from by telling them something important about their ancestor, Abraham. You might remember the story. Abraham heard something calling and he set out to find it. Even though the scriptures tell us, unlike my family out there traveling today or unlike Matt, Abraham didn't know where he was going. Abraham heard God calling him, God calling him to move forward from the comforts and security of his home, 
But God had not provided him with a map or a GPS. God only provided him with a vision of what he would find. Nevertheless, Abraham went forward. Abraham and his descendants went looking for a better country. And the country they were looking for, we are told, was a heavenly one. Now, we might think it took a lot of guts to do that, setting out on an unclear path. But it took something else. We might think that it was simply belief that sustained Abraham and their descendants as they set out for this better country. But it was actually more. It was something more. It was faith. Faith. Now, the difference may seem subtle, But there's an important distinction. See, you or I might believe someone. You or I might have belief if someone tells us, hey, if you want great ice cream, go to Ben and Jerry's. It's about two miles down the road. Take a left and go another mile and a half, and you're going to find it on the right-hand side of the road. We tend to believe them because we know them. They are right there in front of our eyes. What they're telling us makes sense. Their directions are clear. They're unambiguous. They have a track record of telling us the truth, and they've got nothing to gain by deceiving us, and they've got a lot to lose if they do. We might get angry. We might seek revenge on them if they've told us something false, or they might lose their credibility with us. See, belief has a lot to do with the past. Belief is built on things known from our own experience. To have faith, though, is a step beyond. Faith is believing in the truth of something we haven't seen and that we do not see. Faith is trusting in the truthfulness of God, God whom we cannot see and God who has nothing to lose or nothing to gain. And it's not just believing in, it's not just believing in, It's having confidence in, having confidence in something intangible, having assurance, having certainty. Faith has a lot to do with the future, the future and the courage to step out and to meet it. And that certainty that is faith often defies the odds. For example, Abraham's wife, Sarah, Abraham's wife, Sarah, had been promised by God that she would bear a child. And even though she was well past childbearing years, Sarah had faith. Sarah had confidence in the truthfulness of God and of God's promises. And she did indeed give birth to a son. In faith, Abraham and Sarah answer God's call. Go from your country. Go. Go from your country and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And they set out. They set out not yet knowing where they were going to go. They set out regardless because they had confidence. They had confidence in the truthfulness of God's inherent goodness and beneficence. They had confidence that with God leading them, wherever he was going to lead them, everything would be all right. Let's leave them for just a moment. I want to give us another example that might help to enlighten us a little more on this, to clarify this. Several years ago for my career, I had to travel a lot all over the country and tight schedules that meant that I had to fly, I couldn't drive. Nearly every week I would be on an airplane to or from my home in New York flying Flying was okay with me. Well, at least it was okay until we hit turbulence. And then I got nervous. After several months of flying constantly, I chalked up a lot of encounters with turbulence just by the odds alone, if nothing else. I was traveling so often, we were bound to hit turbulence eventually. And each time, my anxiety got worse and my responses grew worse. In fact, it got so bad that eventually my anxiety grew so much that it grew to near paralyzing proportions. And before long, I became so conditioned that I grew nervous even before we encountered turbulence. 
having the strong expectation that we were going to hit turbulence eventually. I was nervous even if we didn't hit turbulence. And as time went on, I was nervous sitting on the runway. Then I got nervous uh, being in the airport, waiting to get on the plane. And as time continued, before long, I was nervous getting in the taxi to go to the airport. I was nervous getting ready to go to the airport. And finally, my anxiety grew so large and it expanded so much, it backed up into my life so far that I was nervous the night before and even the entire day before. So nervous that it was sometimes hard for me to step out of the door and to go to the airport. Now I joke now that if you look under the armrest of a significant portion of the airlines, uh, the American Airlines fleet, you're going to find my claw marks underneath the armrest. On one particularly <laughs> rough flight, I looked around the cabin to see that even the most experienced flyers, even those who had previously looked oh so calm and used to the routine, even they were looking a little bit green. All but one man. One man who was just sitting there with a serene look on his face. And as the bumpy ride continued, I would check back a few times and look at his face, and he still seemed fine. When we finally arrived at our destination and were deplaning, I said to him, excuse me, sir, but that was a really, really bumpy flight. But I couldn't help noticing, I couldn't help noticing how calm you seemed the whole time. Would you tell me, what's the secret? Oh, he said. I didn't have to fly the plane. Simple, right? <laughs> and there I had been sitting there, putting on brakes and steering the plane all the time, thinking it was up to me. Part of me wanted to ask him if he shouldn't be thanking me for having done such a great job with my superhuman mental powers and my ability to steer an entire aircraft with just the armrests. I didn't have to fly the plane. That began to change my perspective. Oh yeah, I still had to prepare for the journey, but when it came time to take off, I had to trust who was in the cockpit. I had to trust in his experience and that he had the ability and that he had a map or a GPS or a whole lot of instruments to guide him. Faith is a lot like that, preparing for the journey and trusting God to fly the plane. Oh, yeah, we've got to prepare. That's our responsibility. Somebody once said, trust God, but put gas in your car. If you're going to jump out of an airplane, wear a parachute. Don't be foolish. Go get your annual checkups. Don't be foolish. But trust God. Now, on the preparation aspect, our scripture lessons this morning teach us a lot about how not to prepare, and they tell us how best to prepare for that journey towards a better place. When we look at our Old Testament lesson from the prophet Isaiah, we get a lot of scary imagery. When she was just reading that, we get getting this really bleak imagery. Isaiah reports a vision he had about God, and in Isaiah's vision, God is really angry, even disgusted at the people of Jerusalem and the larger land of Judah. Now, the situation at that time was that Israel and Judah weren't together. They were split. They weren't a cohesive kingdom. The country was in a state of decline, and the Assyrian Empire all around them, around them was expanding, and it was growing and threatening to them. And Judah was forming bad alliances, making the country even more vulnerable. A split country, bad alliances. The prophet Isaiah saw doom and urged the country to get itself together, to get on a better course, to get on the right course. In his vision, Isaiah reports that we're, the people were going about it all wrong, though. They were going about it all wrong and getting it together. They were busy trying to appease God through animal sacrifices, through bloody burnt offerings. They were trying to appease God by showing their piety in rituals around new moons and full moons, rituals that were empty, and by gathering in great conventions and convocations, and boy, were they on the wrong track. And God tells them, this is futile. 
I never asked this of you. This is an abomination to me, and I'm tired of these things you're doing. I'm sick of them. You see, the people were trying to control the situation by following their own ways, not God's ways. They were trying to buy God's favor, bringing the wrong offerings. In the midst of turbulence and all that they were experiencing, they were not relying on God's inherent goodness. They didn't have the confidence in God's truthfulness or what he had told them was the right thing to do. They didn't have confidence in God's abilities. So their actions were desperate. Their actions were rooted not in faith, but in anxiety. The people were trying to make their own country better through bloodshed, by sacrifices, by having blood on their hands, when what was required for their journey to a better country, what was required to make their country better was clean hands and a pure heart. What was required was turning from evil not turning to evil. But these people were trying to take matters into their own hands, trying to rely on their own devices, going their own way rather than God's way, rather than doing what was right, rather than doing what they had been taught. And the turbulence just got worse. What would make them better, what would make their country better was, the scriptures say, to learn to do good, to seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. That's the way of the Lord. A whole change in attitude would have put them on a better course for the journey. A whole change, not just in attitude, but in action. Stop killing, start loving. If you want a better country, stop killing. Stop the killing now. It's an abomination to God. Stop the bloodshed. It is an abomination to God. I wonder what the prophet would say to us today. The words to us would most likely be the words he used to Judah. Stop all of that and start loving as we've been taught. Loving and caring for one another is the offering that pleases God. That's the right thing to do. Stop the killing. Start the loving. Start the trusting of God. Now when we turn to our gospel lesson from Luke, we get a better picture. We get a picture of a people who are doing better prep work. And here in Luke we have sometimes what's called the parable of the good master. Jesus told his parable to the crowds when he was preaching in Judea, and that was the same southern area that had been called Judah, the same area where Isaiah had proclaimed his vision. And that parable reminds us of what God finds valuable. And what God finds valuable is certainly not blood sacrifices, and it's not riches or fine offerings either. In fact, Jesus tells them, just like we said earlier, Empty yourselves of those things, sell them, and use the money. Use that money to give to the poor. What's needed for uh, the journey towards a better country is a suitcase that's empty of all those things and one that's full of heavenly things. The heavenly things like charity and love won't wear out and they'll never be destroyed. The earthly things will. Stockpiling money isn't going to get any of us there. God doesn't care how much money we have. Putting our focus there is putting it in the wrong place. Stockpiling weapons, stockpiling resentments, packing our bags full of hatred won't get us to a better country. Stockpiling goodness and charity is where our focus should be. Building up a storehouse of love is what's called for. These are the things of heaven. These are the things to pack for our journey in that direction. Now, those of us who are fans of PBS and of series like Downton Abbey and Upstairs, Downstairs and movies like Gosford Park, we're probably going to really enjoy this parable and really relate to it. 
you know, the devoted servants downstairs who were always ready, always on call, ready for the upstairs master. Well, in this episode today, the master has set out on a trip, gone off to a wedding banquet, and the banquet may have been far away. In those, festivities, those days, the festivities could have lasted for several days, even a week. Travel would have been on foot or on the back of an animal, maybe a donkey or a camel. Travel would have been on rough roads. It would have been a slow journey by any means. And the master might well have been gone for a month. No one knew. Servants never knew when to expect the master back. So their role was to be prepared, just like the Boy Scouts, be prepared. And the best servants were on watch all the time. Now, of course, they had to sleep, but at night, they didn't just shut off all the lights and lock the doors. They kept a lamp burning all the time, and they were ready to receive him whenever he came. As a team, they were always on the watch, always prepared. And that's what we're to do. That is exactly what this parable is telling us to do. We who are servants, as our servants, as we servants, wait for the coming of our master, Jesus. In the parable, when the master returns, even at an unexpected time, even at what might be an inconvenient time, he is so delighted with what the servants have done, so delighted that they are so well prepared, that he invites them to the table and serves them the bounty. And just as in that parable, we have hope and we have faith that whenever God comes to us, he will be delighted with our preparations, so delighted with what we have done to to establish his kingdom, to establish the better country, that he'll share his feast with us. That's the promise for us and that's our hope too that we are going to reap from the storehouses and stockpiles that we have helped to build up, that we will share in the wonderful bounty of God. Now we prepare our, for those storehouses, we prepare those storehouses in our watching and in our waiting. And watching and waiting means being good servants and remaining awake and remaining focused on the needs of others, serving, not controlling, not seeking to control our destiny or anybody else's, learning, as the scriptures tell us, to do good, seeking justice, rescuing the oppressed, defending orphaned children, no matter who they are or where they've come from or why they've come here, and pleading for the widow, the refugee, the persecuted, the homeless, the faint of heart. Just as the people of Judah were to have done, and just as we, like they, have been taught. It means being patient, even even when we don't exactly see the road ahead of us, even when things get bumpy. And we can do that. We have the ability to do that. We can do that. We can renounce our pursuit of worldly riches and take this path because our faith is in the goodness of God. Because our confidence tells us that God knows the way. God knows how to fly the plane, so to speak. And God knows how to get us to the better country that he promises. That better country where there's a better life for everyone and there's enough at the table for everyone. Our spiritual ancestors we read about in the scriptures sought a better country, one that was a heavenly one, and that's the journey that we're on to. That's exactly what we pack our bags for. But a quick word of caution before we take off. While we do make ready for the journey... Our arrival point, our arrival to our point of destination won't come because of what we have done. It won't come because we've sweated it out and it won't come because we've flown the plane. It comes 
because the point of origin is God, not ourselves. It comes not because of what we have done, not because we've earned it. Salvation comes because God desires to bestow it. Our desire for God's bounty exists because God desires to give it. It originates in God. Any other understanding is sinful because it puts us in the place of God. And I really want to clarify this. I really want to be very clear on this. So I'm going to say it one more time in one more way. Our yearning, our desire to get to that destination is a response to the first and foremost call, the first and foremost desire of God through his goodness and love to take us there. So look at it this way. The point of origin and the point of destination are exactly the same. The journey begins and it ends there in God. And that's how and that's exactly why we can have faith even when we think that the trip may not always be a smooth one. We get there by God's grace and through our faith that relies on the truthfulness of God, relying on Christ for salvation so that we can step out on the journey, ready to receive what God desires to bestow, confident, confident that will be all that we need we're confident, even though we don't know the flight plan or the exact path or where it may meander, we are confident. We're confident that it will lead to a better country. Confident that the storehouses are full of good things. Faith consists of packing our bags and being ready to step out on the journey. So now is a time to stop for just a moment and to ask, as that television commercial does, what's in your wallet? God calls us. God calls us even now. Even right now. Listen. Listen. Let's be prepared. Let's be prepared and dare, dare to take that step forward. Amen.